And so it's a really, you know, common concept in the US or EU, EU with um, liberal education. But then in Asia, please correct me if I'm wrong, and I hope I am, but I don't really see this transdisciplinary education being really spread around. So like what happens in Asia is more when you enter university, higher education, you already have your speciality, and in first place, it's really hard to change it. And even if you cannot change it, it's really hard to take courses in other disciplines. So my first question would be, how do you see solving that issue. And my second question is, so you emphasized on sustainability, of course, and then, you know, knowledge and also critical thinking. But the very first part of your presentation focused on employability. And I think that's the issue that developing countries in Asia are really concerned about. So whether you think, so what is the road towards increasing employability in ever more globalizing world, whether it is um, transdisciplinary or m maybe it is increasing more mobility or, I don't know, like increasing knowledge about sustainable development goals. Like, I really want to hear your opinion about that. And if the time allows, so your biography said that you did a research on um, Cambodia, Laos, and other countries. And I think all of us would really like to know what that research is about and how this education in those countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I respond to this? Thank you very much for very important questions, which uh, I may not be able to fully respond to, but uh, I, I, I appreciate you really raised the uh, uh, issues uh, which I wanted to discuss with you. First, uh, about uh, transdisciplinary approaches. Uh, yes, uh, the liberal arts education, if you think about, I mean, actually in Asia, I mean, we still have the kind of stereotypical image that at the schools, for instance, you know, we are still forcing the students to do the so-called road learning, you know, to memorize and to, to do the drills and so on. Yes, to some extent, yes, but at the same time, uh, there are more and more classrooms and teachers who are trying to introduce the uh, more, you know, uh, new, new approaches, even at the schools and at the universities as well. I mean, still you find uh, many lectures uh, doing the in conventional manners. However, uh, you know, for instance, uh, uh, many countries are now talking about the so-called active learnings, you know, trying to give more hands-on experiences and then try to encourage students to interact with each other. So situation has been changing, I think, you know, in, even in Asia. However, the pace is not, may not be enough yet. I mean, because the people who are in the teaching positions still have the traditional and the stereotypical mindset. So that's how we, have, we can change. And that's the challenge. And uh, I must confess that uh, uh, it's very difficult. <laughs> I myself is trying to change this uh, at my own university uh, with some of my colleagues. Uh, and uh, we have a good active learning studios, uh, for particularly for the first and second year students. And then um, we introduced the new approaches. For instance, uh, the conventionally, we teach uh, 90 minutes per session, per one, one class. Uh, however, we increase the number to uh, 105 minutes for one class. <laughs> what that means? Extra 15 minutes to teach, to introduce something more active. Why we have to do this? Because many professors, for instance, uh, had registered to introduce more active way of learning, teaching and learning, because they said that they have certain amounts of knowledge they have to teach. For instance, if you teach macroeconomics, you need a certain time. So we said, okay, you can do that. But we increase the number of each session, 15 minutes. So for extra 15 minutes, you can do something new. So in these uh, approaches, step by step, we try to you know, disseminate the idea of uh, making the teaching and learning more active. So but yes, yes, that's, I mean, still far, far away to go. So that's my first response. And second, uh, uh, second point is about uh, employability. This is a huge challenge. <laughs> we, for instance, in case of Japan, still the many students, majority of students have a mindset uh, to try to seek the employment opportunities at uh, established companies, 
right, rather than, for instance, ventures. So uh, these large corporations, they cannot really easily change the corporate culture. So that's a challenge for us, you know, to really change the corporate culture in many large, particular large companies. And so this, this is something we, for instance, people in the higher education cannot do alone. But we have to negotiate with the people in the industries to change their mindset. Another thing, I mean, but at the same time, I mean, many uh, routine manual jobs will be replaced by the automations or technologies or robots. So we don't need, uh, we will not need uh, the number of workers in near future because, you know, many things be automated by the technologies. So what will happen? That we really have to think. And that's why we, I emphasize students have to be prepared for such changes. And then, actually many countries are now talking about the qualification framework to make sure that the students in a certain uh, professions have uh, enough knowledge and skills to be mobile across the borders. So this qualification framework may help some, to some extent. Uh, to not, because there are certain skills and knowledge only human can do. So by promoting the, you know, the, uh, the so-called qualification framework, we may be able to respond to, to some extent. But again, my response is uh, not fully. <laughs> Uh, responding to, to your points, but uh, that's, that's sort of the challenges we are making. And uh, my, my work in Laos, Cambodia, I mean, particularly last more than 10 years, I've been very focusing on the Cambodia, for instance. I've been dealing with many uh, studies on higher education or schools, and then this is just one example of what I'm doing. I mean, the last four years, I, we interviewed the 250 students starting from sixth grade to junior high school, first grade, second grade, third grade, to complete the junior high school. So four years we followed, we chased the same 250 students. Because in Cambodia, many students drop out in junior high school, okay, lower secondary level. So we wanted to know why. And then the government always explained because of the two reasons, financial reason and the gender. The girls have difficulty to go to the schools because the normally the junior high school is located far comparing to the primary schools. And then many parents feel hesitant to send the, the girls, do their daughters to work long distance. So the gender and the financial issues, they always, the government always talk about. But then I had some slightly different feelings, you know. There may be some other reasons. So that's why I Chased. We chased the 250 students starting from sixth grade, first, second, third grade of the junior high schools. And then what I uh, found out, actually the biggest causes for dropping out is the parents. If parents believe the importance of education, no matter whether they are very poor or you know, no matter their kid is a girl, they tend to send try to send the kids to schools. However, when parents do not understand the importance of education, you know, they tend to let the kids drop out. So I just, uh, uh, we just published a book uh, from the publisher in New York last year, and then I just uh, handed this book to the minister a few weeks back, and then I explained the minister what we have identified. And the minister has been, seems to be, you know, convinced <laughs> So I hope, you know, the Cambodian Ministry of Education, Youth and Sports will introduce something new for supporting the kids not to drop out. So this kind of study I've been doing, and I always uh, work with the ministry to exchange uh, the findings. Uh, so. Okay, thank so you. Okay, um, good morning, most respectable speakers and our beloved participants here. I'm here from Cambodia. And firstly, I would like to say thank you um, the both speaker and for your enthusiastic presentation under the topic multilingual communication, um, Dr. Suvilai. So um, I want to ask you some question about the multilingual communication. 
First one is about language hierarchy in Asian community. You have mentioned that um, we, as one in Asian community, we have to learn uh, mother tongue, and then we have to learn um, each national language in each Asian countries in order to interact well with one another. But you have noticed that there are many languages in Asian countries. So I, my question is, how can uh, we manage to learn each and every one of uh, language in all of those countries? And the second one, I want to raise that, um, do you think it is possible that um, we should have one official language for Asian countries to communicate? So thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your question. Um, for the first question, I don't think that I don't think that you have to learn all languages in in uh, ASEAN country because there are about one thousand languages. But as an individual, as an individual, uh, I would recommend, as I put it in the language hierarchy of the ASEAN uh, country, uh, you should start with your mother tongue, whatever your mother tongue is. <coughs> If your mother tongue is the same as the national language, you are lucky because you don't have, you don't have to learn another new language. So normally, uh, in many, in many countries, and, um, and a lot of people have their own mother tongue, which is not the same as the national language. So uh, if it's possible, if it's possible, they just start with the mother tongue. And now there are a kind of uh, an approach which is called multilingual education, which is recommended by uh, UNESCO actually, and it is practiced in various countries, especially in Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, so you start with the mother tongue, and then uh, you have got to learn the national language anyway, because it's important. Uh, it's a lingua franca, uh, and everybody should know, and it's a language of education and everything. So you have got to learn it. But, and also, and not just another language, another foreign language, that is English. Everyone uh, should learn English now. So you will be a multilingual person. As an individual, you can be a multilingual person by just studying your own mother tongue. Or know where your mother tongue, and use your mother tongue, that is important. Uh, because nowadays, the younger generation stop to use the mother tongue, especially if they are indigenous language. Uh, so don't stop using that you go on using it and put it in education as much as possible because it will help you with the cognitive, it will help with the cognitive development for the younger generation. Uh, so, and you learn the natural language and you learn English, so you can be a multilingual person. Uh, but if you have interested in learning other languages, that's, that's great. You can learn our, you, you can learn your neighboring languages, uh, like you are, a Cambodian, right? You speak Khmer, and you may want to learn Thai, which is uh, you know, not, not, not too difficult for you to learn, apart from learning English and others. Or you can learn the indigenous languages in your, in your country if you are interested in, or if you have a chance to work with this group of people. So each of us can be a multilingual person and uh, use it effectively in the multilingual com communication by this way you use just your own mother tongue, your national language and English or any other languages that you are interested in. Would that be clear? Another question I'm not quite get what, what you say it again please. Um, is it possible to have one official language for education? For what? For, for ASEAN which com community. For, for the ASEAN community. For the ASEAN community. One official language. I think English has been recognized mm -hmm. uh, as the uh, language of ASEAN, English, right? Yeah, so, yeah, so English is the uh, language of ASEAN. Would that, would that, is that what you mean? Is that your question? Uh, there's some idea that so we have uh, one official language from like the, the language from the Asian member. Oh, not English. You mean apart from English? So you want to have you, your question is whether we should have an official language. Um, you choose one of the Asian. Yeah, 
languages to be to be the uh, official language of ASEAN. Uh, at the moment, I can I am not I I still have no idea. <laughs> I think because uh, yeah, if you are interested in uh, learning other ASEAN languages, that's great, and in, and that is not difficult to learn. English is more difficult, but anyway, but we have already started learning English. In every school, I think English is compulsory, right? And so now we use English. They're that easy now. Uh, maybe in the future, you may think of having uh, other uh, official language that, that, that is ASEAN, can, ASEAN language. Maybe possible, but in the future, a long, long future, I think. Thank you, Dr. Suwilai. Okay, we will now have um, the break, but break 